Okay. Hey guys, I'm super excited because today we're going to talk about getting the buyer brokerage contract signed and securing your fee, your commission with the buyers out there. And there's never been a more important time to get this work done than today in 2023. And I have a special guest to help motivate all of us and to help us through that process. Broker, you wish you had. My great friend, Jeannie Field. <laughs> Jeannie, could you start with a little bit about there was a survey done with a lot of the brokers across the United States and a, a high percentage of them were not concerned with mm -hmm. the current uh, DOJ, or if you can elaborate on whatever that is. Things, yeah. yeah, they were not concerned by that. Mm -hmm. And when you shared that with me, I said the same thing, which is too many of my agent friends are not concerned with how to negotiate with buyers to secure their fees and how to articulate high level what their real value is to a great buyer client. So could we start with a little bit about kind of what the general concern is right now in the real estate community, just high level summary. So some of my friends who kind of may or not be reading the news may not be aware. There's so much. So let me just give you the 35,000 foot view. We have Correct. two class action lawsuits, both of which have been certified. And if you want to learn what that means, look it up because I'm not going to tell you. Uh, one of one, one of them was done, was certified last year. The other one was certified this year. Uh, and they both are effectively saying to give you the, the, the reader's digest condensed version. They're both effectively saying that we're not given the permissions to understand what their buyer's agent was getting paid. Therefore they were forced to pay a higher price for a property. Had they known what their agent was being paid from the seller, they could have negotiated that. That's thing one, thing two. Uh, this was one that was certified this year. And, and, and actually, at some level, it's worse because this one is saying not only did buyers not have the ability to negotiate what the buyer agent was getting paid, but they also are saying sellers were forced to pay buyer agent commission. So the first one is saying buyers overpaid for houses because they didn't know that they could negotiate, which is we all know that commissions are negotiable. It's in the contracts. But they didn't know what the number was. They couldn't negotiate. Second one is saying sellers were forced to pay buyer agent commissions. And there's a fragment of it that says buyer's agents didn't work for them. Uh, and, and, and we're not going to go down the agency fiduciary stuff. That's not it. Those are the two. Third thing three is the Department of Justice is has said that they felt that the clear cooperation policy, which means that you must be, if you're a realtor member, your, your listings must go in the MLS within 24 hours of marketing the property outside of your company. But it's beyond that because the Department of Justice is tagging on to the private listing network companies, the, the entities that say, I don't want to put my listing in the MLS. I want to market this property uh, with my own personal private group. Yeah. So those three things together have become, oh, hugely important. Um, and, and quite frankly, uh, to go back to the primary topic here, um, had we in the beginning, when I go back to not the late 80s, early 90s, when sub agency went away, agency representation was created. I was managing in those days. I was in Connecticut. And, and at that point in time, the MLS was looked at as a contractual offer of compensation. So mm -hmm. listing agent uh, paid buyer's agent after being paid by the seller. That's a simplistic way of putting it. And so the MLS was the offer of compensation, which is why. Uh, the National Association of Realtors effectively said every listing needs to be put in the MLS and an offer of compensation is required. Back in those days when it first launched, Patrick, it was it was brutal. I mean, but some of it is the same thing we're seeing now. You know, I, I have seen things that people should not be doing, such as on one of the forums on, on a social media site saying that that seller's only that listing agent's only offering me 100 chicken wings and I'm not going to show that property because of the lack of chicken wing compensation to me. I mm -hmm. love chicken wings. Correct. And so... All of those things became the, the big the big elephant in the room. And it's a big elephant in the room. We have to remember that the consumer has to, we have a responsibility to the consumer. Doesn't mean we don't have the right to get paid. But what I am profoundly concerned about is that not enough people are paying attention to this. And wherever I go in the country, when I ask this question of a classroom where I'm teaching and I say, how many of you are aware of what's going on? And I get one to 3% of the people in the room say, I know. This is profoundly, fundamentally capable of changing how we do business in our industry. And I believe it could be as quickly as within a year to a year and a half. Yeah. Other than that, there's nothing going on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I think um, in California, I know the, the California Association of Realtors this year has uh, taken some kind of 
first baby steps in in a direction. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that is worthy there for for the audience that may or not be be aware of some of those things? Well, I th um, I think it's a um, it's a bigger picture because I, as you know, I teach all over the country and yes. I, every state. Uh, is looking at this in a in a different way. I, I suspect this is a prediction. I suspect that what may happen is each state is going to have a mandatory, legally required buyer representation agreement be signed between the agent for the buyer and the buyer. Yes. Uh, and I believe that could happen. This is just me predicting stuff, just because I study this all the time. I believe that that could happen. There are currently already some states that do require that. There are Correct. states that could, and as an example, Connecticut, where I started, requires a buyer representation agreement. Uh, and so I'm seeing that all of the component pieces of a real estate transaction are going to fundamentally have to change. The lending industry has to change. You know, state laws are going to have to change. But it comes down to one very simple thing. Right now, an agent in the in the business today has to learn to get a buyer broker represent buyer represent exclusive right to represent agreement between their buyer and uh, themselves. And Correct. their brokerage, actually, for because for the most part, in every state that I teach in, the brokerage still manages the overall umbrella, if you will. Yes. But the point is that agents must get over their fear factor. And I don't, I've never understood it. If you take a listing agreement, why is it different than taking a buyer agreement? And so we're in that place. But we also have to make sure that agents know how to defend their compensation. Why should I pay you that amount of money? And we as an industry, and this goes back way before any of this stuff, Patrick, it's been a mantra of mine for, for decades, that we are not good at explaining what we do. We're not good at explaining our jobs. We 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 don't have the ability, or that's not fair. We don't take the time yes. <clears throat> to tell the consumer exactly what we do. We, at some level, make our jobs look too easy. And by the way, the first one I talked about, the first class action that was certified last year, in their documentation, and 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 don't fall off your chair right now, or anybody else that watches this, fall off your chair. In the documentation of that class action, the words stated in the lawsuit were specifically, buyer's agents don't really do very much anyway, so why should they get paid that? Got it. Yep. <laughs> so you can see, guys, why today I really want to take some time with uh, Ginny uh, and to work with you guys through what is a unique value proposition that we have and how do we articulate that? How do we break down some of those component parts? Let's take a look at some of those things that we do. And then one of my favorite skills as a coach, as a marketer, as a real estate agent was how do I actually then level up what's called the perceived value Correct. of that service right? and then make it sound really compelling, make it sound attractive. Mm -hmm. And then again, ultimately in today's session, you know, we'd love to get you guys started with having more confidence mm. to be able to share to a buyer, hey, buyer, here is why you would want to hire someone like me. I do things like ABC one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And would you like to get together at my office over some coffee or over a Zoom? And let's discuss how to hire me mm -hmm. to represent you in purchasing your next home. We need more confidence in that. Yeah, and the pleasure. only way you're going to get more confidence is not by learning some script that was taught at some, you know, blah, blah, blah. it's really actually, <laughs> you know, getting some level of integrity around these are some of the things that I'm committed to doing to help my buyer's clients. Here's some of the ways that I protect my buyer clients. Here's some of the unique things that I'm doing in the marketplace to find and to secure my buyer clients a great property. Here's some ways that I like to negotiate to be able to win against competition. And these are some of the wonderful things that, that I would like to do for mm -hmm. you. And then here is a way to hire me to be the one that does that for you. Right. Right. So I think, you know, I like the linguistics of all of this me stuff. Me too. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, you know, you are as a, a broker, you are really at the technical level and high expert, as well as someone who has still sells many homes I still sell you know, today. Homes. So, mm -hmm. you know, so why don't we, why don't we start there? And, you know, if you want to maybe share a couple of your, some of, what do you think are some of the ways that agents should be approaching developing their unique selling proposition to a buyer? What's, what's on, what's hot on your mind these days? When, when I think about my beginnings in the, in the industry in 1986, and I remember back in the day, you know, back, I joke about this, Patrick, but it's true back in the day when I was first selling houses, the phone was attached to the wall and we didn't yeah. have a computer and, you know, there was no exactly do, do, do. And I used <laughs> to have a really long curly cord and you had your fingers, you wore out your fingernail polish, dialing the phone. All of that is true. 
Uh, and so we really didn't talk much about what we did. And and uh, and and frankly, we did a, a bunch of dumb stuff. Dumb stuff meaning, sure, I'll meet you at the house at three o'clock. No problem. Didn't know if they were an axe murderer or not. Right. That's what people did because we didn't pay attention. Today, required. Required. And if I were still managing a brokerage today or managing other agents today, and even when I teach this, you must do the same thing with a buyer that you do with a seller and sit them down and spend the time asking great questions, talking about how do you work? This is what I'm going to do for you. This is how I work. Please understand my job is to protect you, to get the best deal I can possibly get. And by the way, that also includes, and you know this about me, Patrick, no is one of my favorite words. There's a sign on my wall right over there. I'm not going to show you, but it exists on my wall. And no is a complete sentence. It's, it's okay to say no. Right. But we first have to have the time. And I would share with you that every buyer and every buyer agent that they're working with needs to sit down for at least 45 minutes to an hour and just go through how it all works. That includes things like explaining, OK, we're going to go look at we're going to go shopping. We're going to find something that works for you. And then when we fall in love, we're going to write an offer. And after we fall in love and write the offer, and we're going to negotiate on it. So we have to explain what we do. And we don't do that. Years yeah. ago, years ago, I don't I don't know how many years ago it was, but there's there was a former president of the National Association of Realtors named Pat Combs, C-O-M-B-S, if you want to look her up. And she actually testified before Congress on what does a real estate professional really do. And you can Google this today. And, and, and it used to be 184, 186 things a real estate professional does. And when you sit down and explain all of that, I can share with you when I do it, nobody has a problem with me getting paid. The coolest thing in the whole wide world is to have a buyer say, you know what, I can't wait for you to get paid. You've earned every dime. But that's yeah. because I'm talking to them throughout the process. This needs to be a collaborative relationship. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and when you do that well, and let's pretend you're my client. So Patrick, I want us to get together at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and we're going to go through this entire process. Does 10 o'clock work for you? Remember those days, Patrick? Yes, that's 10 right. O'clock work? Does 10 o'clock work for yes, you? Does 10 o'clock work? Yeah. It does work for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> yes. And then you sit down and you go through the entire process. You talk about everything. And, and when had we been doing that all along, I truly don't believe we'd be in the position we are as an industry and we're in a tough place because yeah. I am, I am, I'm honestly very concerned. So yeah, can uh, I, I'm going to put a stamp on that last statement really fast and, and kind of transition from there, which is what I noticed when I got into, uh, into sales around 2014, coming out of being a, a trainer and a, a sales trainer, a sales coach for, you know, for 12 years at that point, 13 years, whatever it was. I came from the sales training industry. So it was really, what do we need to say? What do we need to do to get a contract signed? And most of the real estate industry was focused on getting listing contract signed. Yes. And so we had mastered the art of what is all the educational process? What is the sales process? What are the questions? What are the surveys? What yeah. do we need to be able to do to be able to help the customer, right. you know, make a good decision about listing their property with you at the price that's going to cause it to sell, you know, within a reasonable amount of time and handle all the objections and, and negotiate all of the fees in the structure and so on and so forth. What I learned was the industry, since I had been in it, has spent 90% of its attention with some of the brightest minds in the industry, with some of the best coaches, the best trainers, with the top producers, all obsessing over everything on the listing process. And then when it came to the buyer, mm -hmm. it was almost like the stepchild, bastard stepchild in the room. And so I just want everybody in the end, you know, my friends out there, maybe newer agents or some of my veteran agents, you please need to understand the whole industry has kind of neglected this Correct. topic, and you're, which is which why is, it's so critical that right. and we what, get to work on this immediately. Which is what, what you just explained so brilliantly, my friend, is that's exactly why this first class action lawsuit can say, well, what do buyer's agents do anyway? Because exactly. what you just described is true. And, and we never took the time. Now, and that's a collective we, that's a 35,000 foot we. Were there people that did it from the beginning? Yes, Absolutely. there were. But, but, but frankly, we collectively didn't do a good job of explaining to the agent how they needed to spend as much or more time connecting with that buyer. You know, people all the time say, well, you know, they went to somebody else and, and so what? Well, did you ask for a buyer? Well, no, I didn't. Well, that's on you, dude. I mean, if you didn't sit down and say, here's my value, here's what I'm worth. For what I'm worth, I get paid this amount of money. And 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 by the way, there's some two, two things I need to jump in here uh, that are very important to, to know. They're, they're, the Code of Ethics, this is because of the settlement with the Department of Justice. And by the way, anybody that watches this can Google all this stuff and Google all they want and find everything. But, but there were two things that changed within the Code of Ethics. Thing one was 
you can no longer say, oh, by the way, Patrick, my services to you are free because the seller is paying me. Can't say that. Oh, interesting. That's, Unless that's... you're really not going to get paid. Unless you're a tour guide taxi service and you're working in a charity business, you're not, you can't say that. Right. That's in the code now. Okay. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I know and a lot of people don't know that thing too. You also have to make sure that well, the MLS rules have changed to make compensation transparent. That was a big thing. Yeah. Compensation is no longer hidden and you are required. There's a three thing. You are required to make sure that your buyer knows exactly what the offer of compensation is on every transaction. And you cannot say to the buyer, well, I don't want to show you, or even to yourself, I don't want to show you that house because it's not enough compensation for me. Right. That's that's thing two. Mm -hmm. The thing three piece is that <laughs> you must have that conversation and say, and, and this is again, it's part of thing two, but thing three. Just want to let you know, Patrick, that you know, we talked about your criteria and I found a couple of houses that fit your criteria. Uh, but one of them isn't, and this is after you have your contract signed, one of them isn't offering me compensation that uh, is, is going to meet the agreement you and I had in terms of what I want to get paid. It's your decision, buyer. Do you still want to see that property or not? Mm -hmm. Because you cannot not show a property just because you're not going to get paid what you think you're worth. Yes. It yeah, all comes down to communication and conversation throughout the entire process, which proves our worth. Yeah. And so let's just put a stamp on this one point, which is, I have found with, you know, talking to many of some of the best buyer's agents in the country that this conversation about, hey, Mr. Buyer at a consultation or in a formal setting saying, do you know how we get paid? Correct. And then that conversation leads into, you know, in, in the MLS, the seller and the listing agent negotiate a fee that mm -hmm. goes compensation to me, the buyer's agent. And so I found that in that explanation, even with myself, the buyer was enlightened. They they appreciated that. And then what was fantastic is, you know, as we're all developing great rapport and deepening these relationships with, with these buyers, the buyers start, rec you know, recognizing your hustle and recognizing what you're doing. Of course, we got to work on that too. Then when I shared with them what the, you know, you know, this particular listing, the fee is a little lower than what this other one was. It was wild. I had many of them, you know, really on my side Correct. supporting me, right? right? And this was, and I, and I never had gone through the process of saying my minimum standard is, mm -hmm. but it, it was just, you know, through the natural process of being Correct. a good educator, right. being transparent, and then doing a great job for my clients. A lot of times, some of the buyers actually they they write checks to their buyers agents be out of appreciation well be careful with that don't say those words because we can't write to checks directly to but we can process it through the transaction so let me speak Correct. to that i want to make sure so it's similar okay. but but again be careful because i'm not going to say where i was and i'm not going to say who said it but i had somebody say because the veterans administration does not allow a that veteran buyer to pay a buyer broker compensation. So when I say everything's going to change, based on all of these lawsuits, everything's going to change, including the lending industry. Mm -hmm. Remembering that every single dime must appear on the settlement statement. Right. But then there's that question, and what's come up a ton is people saying, well, buyers don't have any additional money, especially first-time home buyers or FHA buyers or even veteran buyers. What do they do? The compensation that you want to be paid can still be rolled into the transaction. Can't be added to the mortgage because lenders are not going to allow that at this stage, but it can be rolled into the transaction and therefore it becomes part of the entire deal. And by the way, who pays the compensation anyway? The buyer pays the compensation by paying the seller the money that they're selling their home for. And through that transaction is the cost of the sale, which comes back to the buyer. It's a big circle. So the compensation can still be paid through the transaction because the buyer and the seller can agree to do that. And, and so it can get messy but it, it doesn't have to be messy. And you were your words were brilliant because what you said you did is you had conversations with your buyers throughout yeah. the entire process. Let me explain this. Let me explain that. Now, and if I take it to the nth degree, which which isn't a very happy one, well, it doesn't bother me because I kind of know how to do it, but it's going to bother some others. There is a very real possibility-ish, probability possibility, pick a word, that there could be sometime in the not too distant future a situation where there is no longer an offer of, offer of compensation in the multiple listing system to the buyer's agent. Yeah. Which means that if you don't know how to do it now, before that happens, you better get ready because if it happens and you're just, otherwise you're just a tour guide. Yeah. And that's to me, you know, in today's session is to get that process Correct. started. I want Correct. all the agents to be able to negotiate their, their worth, worth of their services to Correct. any of the buyers that they're talking to, regardless 
of what the listing agent and the seller is offering in the MLS. That is, let's get on that immediately, which of course would cause every agent out there. This means that you must start to understand and articulate what you do and the value of that and to be able to look closely at that. So I'd want to share just a little bit about some of you. I think we've set a very strong precedent that this is no longer optional. Everybody must get on with this and practice this just like you practice your listing presentations. And instead of there being 400,000 training programs and videos on, you know, mastering your listing presentation, it should be, we should be working on our buyer buyer compensation presentation, Mm -hmm. right? So a couple of the things on my side, you know, kind of in the coaching training space, Jeannie, that I've, you know, I was articulating with one of my coaching clients this week was, you know, in his presentation, we do a lot of, and I'd love to get your opinion on this. We do a lot of off-market attraction. So we take, you know, what our buyers want and we go direct to homeowners Mm -hmm. and we, you know, we find deeply what this, what our buyers want. We go into the marketplace and we go communicate with homeowners. And there, I did a, an extensive uh, YouTube video where, you know, a lot of my clients would write an offer in this last couple of years. The offer would not get accepted because of multiple offers. And I, and I was literally like, you just wrote an offer on a particular property in a community go offer that offer to everybody in the neighborhood in that community. and just mm-hmm. go find the next seller. Uh, there was a guy that when I was still managing and I was working for a large, I had a 250 person office. Mm-hmm. I lived, uh, it was a large office, very successful. I had a ton of agents there. And I had a guy that did exactly that. And if he had a buyer that was looking for a very specific thing, he would find the place that that thing could exist. And then he would knock doors and say, yeah. I've got a buyer ready to go. And he did three or four transactions in one year just that way. Yeah. And that's exactly it. You know, yes. When you in, were, in, in, the, in the video that I did, I said, mm-hmm. imagine this imagine your best friend in the world. Mm-hmm. It comes to you and says, I would like to buy a house. And then there's no MLS. Mm-hmm. If the MLS didn't exist mm-hmm. and you cared so dearly about your best friend in the world, what would you do? How are you going to find that house? Right. And this is where I thought it's good. And then I started with the easiest places to start Mm -hmm. and then work your way down to the most difficult, Mm -hmm. the easiest place to start. Could you go into your phone today and see, do I know anyone that lives in that community? Mm -hmm. If you know another agent, you know, a a title rep, you know, a banker, you know, you have a friend, you have a past client, anyone that you know, call them up and ask them, have you heard any rumors of one of your neighbors think about selling? I've got a great client. And like, that's easy to do. Easy to do. You could go into your email database of you know hundreds of people and you can say, hey friends, would you do me a huge favor? I've got an amazing couple and they would be interested in buying in this neighborhood. I just wrote an offer. They're, they're fully capable. Please, you know, if you've heard anything, let me know. Easy to do. Mm-hmm. The hardest would be to go do the door knock, but mm-hmm. obviously we know that that would be direct and effective. So, so, the off-market strategy is an offer that Brilliant. we can make to a Absolutely. potential buyer that says, I would be willing to go do all of this effort for you beyond what's on the MLS Correct. to be able to help secure a great Correct. property for you. Yep. Yep. Easy peasy. Easy peasy. I think another um, thing that we don't talk about enough and we don't level up the perceived value of is due diligence. Mm. Right. So I just wrapped the term due diligence and I'd love to hear any commentary from you on this. But, you know, in California, we do the inspection and we do we read the seller's disclosures and we may or may not, you know, set up a few more inspections on the property. Mm -hmm. You know, we do, you know, the agent visual inspection. But, you know, the process of due diligence is actually incredibly important and valuable. Yeah. I was speaking to one of the literally one of the top 50 most successful real estate agents in the world on this one topic. And he is like, because he's been in, so many houses sold so many houses. He is really ruthlessly good at studying inspection reports, seller disclosures, mm, mm, going mm, deep mm. into understanding what that property is, mm-hmm. and then pointing out any potential uh, threats, maintenance, anything that the buyer would need to know. So when he speaks to his buyers and, and is, is talking about due diligence, they literally are like, wow, like right, right, right. you right. are a protector and a wealth of knowledge Correct. that are going to, is going to help me in this, Brilliant. you know, on this journey, I absolutely want you, right? Right. Uh, another thing that, you know, for me, and I just kind of found that I did this uh, uh, instinctively just for myself was when I was talking to buyers, I say, you know, 
when I looked at this particular property for them, I looked at the floor plan, I looked at the location, I looked at the lot, I looked at just some of the basic foundations of a good property. And I just said to him, look, I just want you to know that reselling this property is not necessarily going to be easy for me if and when you ever choose to do that. So therefore, I think you want to put into consideration that all of the maintenance that's going to go into this may be something that is not going to t- return a really good profit into the future. Mm-hmm. And it was just my knowledge and wisdom experience. And I just see their eyes light up in appreciation. Mm-hmm. And that's when I knew, wow, I, I, oh my gosh, I know something that has tangible value, not only for their future, for their life, for their, their bank account, for this property, but also for the long-term future. Yeah, and absolutely. that's when I was like, oh my gosh, like, I've got something that they value. That's this correct. is cool, right? I, Protecting I, them, yes, I'm finding opportunities, yes. and I'm also kind of helping them to, to understand, you know, how this this investment is going to play out, right? So there's all these little nuances that pretty much when I and, and you know when I talk to agents all the time, they do these things, mm-hmm. but when I ask them to articulate their value as a buyer's oh my agent, gosh, yes, they exactly. literally go brain dead. They're like, yeah, I don't yeah, know, yeah, I yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I I show them property and I. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I write oh, up the offer. I'm that like, was, let me jump in here because one of the things I said back in the day, and that was brilliant, Patrick, and I love what you said. I just put a young Navy couple into a home in Temecula. He works at Naval Base in San Diego. And I looked at him and I said, are you out of your mind? Do you understand what it's like driving from Temecula to, to downtown San Diego at right. the time you have to be there? He said, and he, but I asked those questions. Right. But what you're talking about is articulation of your value. Now, here's what I used to do when when people would say to me, when agents, when I was still managing agents would say to me, Uh, Well, how do I do that? I said, here's what I want you to do. From the moment you meet them until the moment it closes, be an attorney and write down every 15 minutes. What did you do in that 15 minutes for that person? Mm -hmm. Was it going over the title report? Was it going over the inspection report? Was it negotiating on their pass on their behalf on on uh, on repairs and so on? What did you do? And, And just unpack that whole process from moment one to moment close. You've just created your value proposition. Exactly. Because if you're doing that with them, you're going to do that with everybody. Now you have been able to create a document that articulates your value. So kind of what you said, but those who say, I don't know what to do. What do I do? Just do that. Yeah. I met Patrick today. He wants to look at this play, na- neighborhood. Here's what he wants to spend. And first 15 minutes or first hour, we did a buyer presentation. We talked about what I do. We talked about the process. I gave him a list of tasks, et cetera, he's going to be involved in. And I talked about what I'm going to be involved in. And that took an hour. Hour one. Yep. Now keep going. Showed houses, looked for property, decided which ones, talked about. I mean, it, it's not rocket science. It's just a different path than anyone's been used to doing since it all changed when sub-agency went away in the late 80s, early 90s. I mean, that's how long ago. Yep. Yeah, it's exactly couple other things that I noticed for me just personally was um, t- talking to my buyer clients about, you know, how their purchasing power translated, right. talking about what the cost of living in this particular property yes, was, yes, yes. Uh, discussing with them in more depth, you know, the cost of maintenance and repairs, um, the, the, the different types of properties of, you know, okay, are we, you know, what's pros and cons of new construction, pros and cons of buying a remodeled rehab, pros and cons of buying a property that was half remodeled recently ish versus mm-hmm. buying the buying the, the as is property that needs a lot of love versus the investment mm-hmm. and then being able to you know talk about and be able to be a resource for those mm-hmm. different types of properties and then also being able to talk about different per, uh, price points in locations right. lifestyle qualities of those locations and then kind of what you get and so and it was only after i had looked at you know hundreds and hundreds of properties you know, and, and started to be able to go through many transactions that I actually realized, wow, oh my gosh, look at how much I know. Cool. Then when I'm now having a conversation with a buyer and I say, here's some of the ways that I like to, you know, help my clients find really the best property for them, usually in the ways that they may or may not be aware of today. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Then they're like, wow, this mm-hmm. is great. You know, this, you know, and then the more I also learned and interviewed many different lenders, lending institutions, and started to get a sense of the lending world, all of a sudden, I and, you know, kind of what they uniquely offered to different scenarios, that also became a big value proposition, because now I had 
relationships with some of the best lenders in the some of the biggest and most important institutions. And I knew which ones to kind of quarterback and introduce, you know, so there was like, that only came through my due diligence of doing you, lots of interviews and meeting lots of people and, and going stuff. through lots of headaches with horrible lenders who were incompetent. And, you know, so it's like the value of that mm -hmm. is undeniable. Mm -hmm. So and again, there's, there's translating also, those details yes. and then leveling up the perceived correct, value correct, correct, of correct. your explanation of it. Correct. And, and also talk about things like, again, that young Navy couple uh, HOA, they're moving into community with an HOA. What does the mm -hmm. HOA allow? What does it not allow? I mean, right. you have an obligation. I believe agents have an obligation to read those documents and understand them. Right. It doesn't mean you're going to be the be all end all. It just means you're going to have that conversation and say, because this couple had dogs and how many dogs you want to have and what can you do? But everything you just said is all articulation of your value. And the most important piece to that, and why is my business hundred percent referral? Because of what you just said, Patrick, when, when the people that I work with, especially the buy sides, because I'm mostly a listing agent, but the buy sides, when I've done that well, everybody, they're going to tell everybody how wonderful, you don't have, my agent did this for me and my agent did that for me. And exactly. this is the only person you used to speak to. And that's why you get repeat and referral business, which is ultimately the goal. Because when you close that deal, you have a past client mm -hmm. and then you got to work that past client and build that relationship in perpetuity. So we will live through this. I promise you, it's just going to be painted with a different brush, I think. Yep. And I'm excited. Thank you so much for your time on this topic and helping us to understand this, the really severity. This is this now is the time for us to get to work on yes. this. Yes. I want all of my friends and my clients and all my all the agents out there to have a buyer consultation yes, and a buyer presentation equally as good as your listing presentation. Yes, please. How about that? Yes, please. Yes, please. Thank you guys for your uh, wonderful attention on this. Jeannie Field, you're amazing. I'll put all Thank your you. contact information down below. She has started her own YouTube channel, yes. very high level with some brilliant people in the industry. So yep. if you guys want to follow her, I'll find her on YouTube. I'll put a link down below and then we'll see you guys on the next episode.